so so far i was uh, also covering some uh, green and little bit black concepts also in between but now i will stick to this uh, yellow belt only so that we can finish it and then uh, any people interested in my next uh, green and black belt program they can join so then we will be covering with more practical mini tab examples and uh, then uh, you know it, it is going to be a structured and more uh, uh, value added uh, course for you so now i am going to uh, restrict with the yellow belt concept only so that we can finish it and you will be you know you will get sufficient time for your exams okay so let's start so the last time uh, i just thought uh, talk to you that we are going to discuss about the process capability now let's understand what is a process capability for an example i'm taking an so i have sorry here the is there any highlighted pen in okay for example i want to dispatch a, a courier okay so uh, from here to uh, maybe uh, from mumbai your msc maybe uh, your certificate whatever it may be so i just approached one courier company and i said that today i am uh, giving you and tomorrow i have to dispatch it. so how many courier company will be able to uh, you know do it in the today itself maybe uh, nobody are capable of doing it isn't it now let's take another example like uh, the government of india uh, wants to build a a, a over bridge uh, across a river okay so now uh, if they will definitely put a, a bit isn't it government of india is going to put a bit now this is this bridge is around uh, you know, 4 km for example 4 or 5 km let's take an example of uh, bogiville project of azam across brahmaputra there was a uh, road as well as rail uh, construction it's a big project now suppose government want to uh, wants to uh, you know uh, give bid and select a supplier now who are all will be supply, uh, you know capable of doing this maybe lnt or some other uh, companies uh, shahpur ji kalanji like uh, uh, company like tata seven existence so, so there are so many uh, companies who are capable of doing this isn't it now if such a project can be given to a small company small contractor then they are not able to uh, fulfill it you know they don't have the capability to complete that project so we are going to discuss something about the capability capability of a process what is capability how capability can be quantified all these things we are going to discuss today now uh <clears throat> introduction to process cap processes and process capability then we are going to discuss two things for process capability we are going to discuss two things one is called specification limit and one is control limit and then how to compare two different processes using the process capability <coughs> now process capability process process capability <coughs> process capability is ability of a process to meet the customer specification <laughs> it's an important tool it can use for the selection of uh, best two competing process predicting the extent of variation in any process etc now let's let's try to understand what is process capability <laughs> now suppose we know what is process process is a set of activities that transforms input into output now any process every process has its own inherent ability to produce a product or service for example i have taken the lnt lnt construction company acc now lnt is construction company they have a certain you know have a process have their an inherent ability produce that to product a produce or service depending upon the type of uh, men, men involved process machine involved in the process material supply for the process method used etc so now uh, this makes this is an inherent ability okay of lnt for example if a local contractor what makes uh, what is the difference between a local contractors and an lnt it's their capability it's their ability isn't it in their ability and what is the difference now the people in lnt they have they are very highly skilled project manager certified people whereas such people will not be there in with a local contractor the machine involved lnt will have a more uh, big uh, you know machines uh, technologically advanced 
whereas a local conductor will not have it. So material supplied, etc. Now it depends. It depends upon whether what is the what is the situation. Sometimes you don't need a big company like LNP. You can get it done into the local local contractor. So it depends upon what is your requirement. What is the customer requirement? Okay. Now what is let's understand what is what is this inherent capability of a process and this inherent capability or ability of a process is expressed as control limits now here comes the control limit you'll see what is this control control limit okay now what is uh, the output specification of output is given by the customer okay now it has nothing to do with the inherent ability of the process isn't it now I am going to ask, go to a courier company and I say, today I want to dispatch this uh, courier. I am giving it today. Or for example, I gave it today morning to a courier company and I asked them, I want it to be delivered to MRC Mumbai within this afternoon itself by 2 o'clock. I am giving it on 9 o'clock and I am asking to deliver them on 2 o'clock. Now, I, it has nothing, my, this is my customer requirement. Customer requirement has nothing to do with your inherent ability of the process. Now the courier company, what they will do, they will say, no, sir, we are not capable of delivering it. We are not capable of delivering it on today, two o'clock. We are capable of delivering, if you give me today morning, nine o'clock, we are capable of delivering it tomorrow by two o'clock. Yes, then you can give us. Now the customer can give their specification thereon depending upon their requirement. Now it is customer's uh, duty to select a supplier who is capable of doing that. Okay, customer can ask anything. But are you capable of giving that customer's uh, delivery, meeting the customer requirement? So that is how the capability is defined. So capability of a process is its ability to meet that customer's expectation. Now let's understand a more, uh, so, so there are two things in that. One is called control limit. Now let me tell you, <clears throat> there are two things called specification limit. Now this is given by the customer. The case specification limit is given by the customer. Now what is specification limit? For example, I said, okay, I have to deliver this by today 2 p.m. on 21st March. This is my specification. Now I have given the specification. Sometimes I may give, okay, 2 p.m. by 22 March. That is my customer requirement, delivering this packet to Mumbai MRC. Okay. Now this is called specification. When I say now, let us take another example: chemical engineering process, some process, some 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 viscosity of a uh, some some uh, uh, liquid or whatever it may be. Or or let us take an like a product that I am asking my supplier to give me a product or a uh, shaft which is having a diameter of twenty plus minus two mm. For example, this is my requirement. Now I have given this supplier specification to my supplier. Make some thousand, thousand uh, crankshafts of uh, this diameter, or maybe a, some uh, product with this length, whatever it may be. Now for I have given this specification. Now what is the specification? This is ten. now what is the specification width? That means I have there is an upper specification limit and a lower specification limit that is USL and LSL. Now what is USL? USL is 20 plus 2, that means 22 mm is my USL. And here at lower 20 minus 2, that means 18 mm is my LSL. So I need to get this product within these two specifications. Now what is the specification width? Specification width is equal to 22 minus, <coughs> 22 minus 18. So my specification width is 4 mm. This is my width of specification. That means what is the width of this between USL and LSL? USL minus LSL, 4 mm. This is my specification width. So this is important in identifying the process capability. So you understood specification width. What is specification width? Now let us understand control width also. Now second thing is control width. Now, I think you all know this. I asked you once, who is giving control limit and specification? Now, who is giving specification width? Who is giving specification limits? 
customer 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 so who is giving control limits supplier product owner process owner anybody else no limits you can which a process can do okay now you understand here control weight control limits are given by nobody nobody is setting the control limits it is your process itself it's your process okay it depends upon the man involved in this process so a base set of from the data you have taken from the process from this data your control limits are defined and it may it may change today you take a set of data the control limits may change tomorrow it may change so it, it keeps on changing but with not much but slightly it, will, it, it keeps on changing every time now if you want to improve drastically then you need to have an improvement project and then improve it but otherwise control limits keep on vary and it is nobody is setting the control limit control limits are actually taken from the data process data now how will you define the control limits naturally shivat said that control limits are your control limits natural control limits are lying plus minus 3 standard deviation of your mean from your mean that means you if you take from a set of data take mean and then your control limits are between mean plus 3 standard deviation now you get a data today this month you have taken data from your process you get a mean you get a standard deviation next month when you take a mean you will not get the exact mean here of course very near to this mean you get and very near to the standard deviation you get so you will get another mean and standard deviation so this is a continuous process when you make control charts you will learn it in the control chart phase okay so mean plus minus 3 sigma is your natural control limits so any variation see if you take this these two lines is upper control limit and lower control limit what is upper control limit mean plus three standard deviation and lower control limit is mean minus three standard deviation now naturally the process will be within this okay and whatever this measurement variation happening output variation that is natural variation okay now your control limits are your control limits are what is control limit what is upper control limit upper control limit is equal to tell me please mean plus three sigma mean plus three sigma what is lower control limit mean minus mean minus two yes mean minus two now tell me what is control width six sigma yes so the control width this is equal to ucl minus lcl that means mean mean will cancel if you minus this to mean mean cancels minus 3 plus that means is equal to 6 into standard deviation okay so your control width is 6 into standard deviation now tell me okay <clears throat> if if you want to improve your control width what is that you are going to improve improve we learned that lesser the standard deviation better the process isn't it if you of the improve your uh, reduce your standard deviation your process is better we'll discuss that okay so you understand control with this six five now what is your process capability cp process capability is equal to specification width divided by control width now what is specification width this is upper cell that means usl minus lsl divided by Six into standard deviation. This is going to be a process capability, capability of the process. Now there is another indice called CPK. Okay, this is CP, CPK. CPK is uh, you, you know uh, finding out the whether the process is centered. So CPK is a real process capability. We will discuss CPK. in this slide continuous slide right? but let us first understand the cp process capability so the process capability cp is equal to specification width divided by control width 
that means is equal to usl minus lsl divided by 6 in the standard deviation so if you know what is your usl what is your lsl and what is your process standard deviation then you can find out the cp isn't it okay now let's have a example so all this thing same i have this uh, this test same thing like if you have a um, uh, uh, process with uh, mean as 200 and standard deviation as 10, then your control limits are going to be sample is 10, mean is 200, and uh, standard deviation 10, then your UCL is 200 plus 3 into 10, that means mean plus uh, uh, LCL is mean minus 3 standard deviation, UCL is mean plus 3 standard deviation, control width is 230 minus 170, in other words, it is same as 6 into Standard deviation. Standard deviation is 10. So your control width is 6 in the Okay. Now specification limit I have explained it is given by the customer. Okay. Now, for example, uh, if you want uh, a some something with, with a temperature of 90 plus minus 4 degrees centigrade. All these things are examples of. Now you want to deliver the courier with 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So you, you can ask them to, okay, uh, this is to be delivered between uh, tomorrow to Mumbai by between 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. I can give the specification, okay? Specification limits are given by the customer. <clears throat> specification limits are given by the customer, whereas control limits are? Natural variability. Okay. Natural variability. It is not set by top management. It is not set by producer. It is not set by supplier. It is a natural variability of any process. This, this is very, very important. So process capability example, operation manager of some company. Now, let's say example, like I want to uh, select four suppliers and uh, the suppliers, my, my requirement is, this is my requirement, 40 plus, 40 plus minus 5 mm, okay? Now, I have four suppliers like A, B, C, D, okay? Now, I want to select one best supplier. So, what is, this is done by, normally done by the OEMs. If they want to select a supplier, what they do? They have their specification, then they will have a list of suppliers, uh, 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 you know, the, like uh, uh, initial document verification and done. They ask for supplier, supplier will apply for it. And then uh, they uh, see the uh, documents and then they shortlist some supplier. And then they will go to the supplier premises and they select a supplier. It's a called supplier audit. Now, suppose this, this company went to the supplier premises and did an audit. Okay. Now, uh, what they did is they went and selected only random samples of shafts of that uh, product. Now, and then they conducted a capability analysis. Let us see how it is done. For example, now these are the Supplier, like supplier A, supplier B, supplier C, supplier B. Now they collected 20 samples and they found that all the, everybody is having the mean as 40. Now tell me, which is the best supplier here? Can you say who is better? So can't say yet. We have to oh. calculate the CP first. Yeah. So this is not enough, isn't it? This data is not enough to identify which supplier is. Now tell me, mean is same for all. Now what is that going to make the difference? Standard deviation. Standard deviation. Now standard deviation is going to make the difference. Now what? Let us see. Supplier A standard deviation is. 3.76. Now, see if the same data is put into an Excel, and then if you make the standard deviation, you will get the standard deviation. See, now this is mean and standard deviation 3.76. This is B and this is C. This is now tell me which is the best supplier? 0 0.08 supplier B. Supply. B. Now, see you. If this is clear that if the, this is supplier D is because less than the standard deviation, better the process performance. Now you can see that if you if I draw all the four graphs, so if you see this 40, everybody is mean is 40. 
Uh, what makes a difference? Like, for example, if I draw a graph of supply array, it will look like this. And if I draw a supply of the B, then it looks like this. And if I draw a supply C, it looks like this. And if you draw the supply D, it looks like this. So this is supply D and the best step supply. Now, what makes a difference? The standard deviation. Why? So when you make this standard deviation, what is the control width here? For supplier A, supplier A, what is the control width? Yes. So six into standard deviation. Three point three point five seven six. So somebody can calculate and give, tell me. Your mobile can calculate. Twenty-two point five six. Twenty-two point five six. Twenty-two point five six. So what is the control width for the one point six eight? 10.08. 10.08. And what, what is this? 10.08. Oh, and for supply of C? 6.36. 6.36. And supply of D? 0 0.48. 0 0.48. Now see, now this is the width of supply A. Supply A's width is 22.8. 22 22.5, 22 isn't it? 22.5. Now for a supplier B, this is a bit, what is that? 10.8, okay? Now this is how, this, now the better one is the D, okay? Now let's see. Now let's draw this. Now supplier is processes. Now see, this is a specification limit, isn't it? Specification limits are same. Like the, what is my specification? I need a sharp plus 40 plus minus five, isn't it? 40 plus minus five means, what is that? Upper is 45, lower is 35. That means specification width is 10. Okay. Now, what is my control width? Let's see. The control widths are here. Now, see, the supplier is process width or the control width is more than the supplier width, isn't it? That means control width more than specification width now suppose if i take the ratio of specification width by control width how much it will come well, less than one or more than one less than one less than one less than one okay so here the cp here the cp is less than one isn't it okay yes, sir now see, and moreover, see, there are defects. Anything going away is defects. See, crossing the control. Now, so there are, after this, there are, this process is up to this one. So this process, tail end is going to cross the USL and LSL. So there are going to be defects. Now let us see supply B, second supply. They are just, just same as supply B. Right? That means the Control width is equal to specification width. That means if SW by CW, how much it comes? One. Now still there are chances of defects also because you know if you do the minute the PPM comes in you know, a overall it comes there are there are chances of defects also. Any small deviation in this process, if process is shifting here, process is shifting here, it looks nice now. But anytime your process is shifted either side, it's going to make defects, isn't it? Now the third one. Third one is here the control width is less than the specification width. Now what will be the CPF? No, more than one or less than one? More than more than one. Okay. Now this the fourth one, the best process. Okay, now you remember this. We have shown you in the shooters example four different shooters, and uh, who is the best shooter? Okay, so similar way, if here CP is less than one, when CP is less than one, process is not capable. Nowadays, even this is not the best process capable. It is said that CP should be 1.33. It should be even CPK. CPK should be more than 1.33. We will see what is CPK also. So this is uh, process not capable, and here it says process just capable. No, it's not. Nowadays, it's not like that. 
if process is capable only when CPK is more, more than 1.3. Here, CP more than 3, it's capable, it's capable. So this is how it is. Okay, CP is, and I'll tell you one thing. If CP is equal to 2, if CP reaches to 2, that means it is a 6 sigma capable process. Okay. Now, the same thing I said, this is explained. Uh, CP is equal to specification width by process width. That means USL minus LSL. So divided by 6 sigma. Okay. And uh, you got a CP here as this. C. Supply rate, CP is less than 1. It is just 1. It is 1.5 and this is 2. So if you want to select two suppliers, you are going to select these two suppliers. So clear how we can use the CP for a selection of a supplier or identify the capability of a supplier. Okay. But there is another measure called the CPK. CPK means it's not that always your process looks in center. Now, this is a, a hypothetical data, for example, I have taken, but it is never in center. Sometimes the process is shifted towards right or shifted towards right. This is natural, quite natural. Every time you will not get the same mean. The mean is shifted, either it is shifted here and there. Okay. Now, we need to know whether the process is shifted and is there any process, etc. So, CPK is the better process, better in this. Okay. What is CPK? In CP, what we have used, we have used USL and LS, isn't it? We have used USL minus LS. Now, CP takes only one part and then compare with me. Now, let's see how it is done. Now, what is the formula for CPK? CPK, you have to find two, two things. One is called CPU and CPL. Now, CPU is nothing but USL minus mean. And instead of 6S, we take 3S divided by 3 sigma, 3 standard deviation. Now, what is CPL? CPL is mean minus LSL divided by 3 standard deviation. Now you get two indices, CPL and CPL. Now we will take whichever is minimum. Whichever is minimum is taken as CPK. Okay. Now CPK is taken as a real, a real process capability, not CP. CP, of course, when you do in Minitab, you get CP, but we take the capability as CPK. Now CPK also tells us one more thing. What does it mean then in that case, if if you get CP is equal to CPK, what does it mean? It won't get, it won't, we won't get it like that. Always CPK will be lesser than CP. You will never get CPK higher than CP. CPK will be always lesser than CP. But suppose if you get CP is equal to CPK, what does that mean? The process is process centered. Center. Very has been at the center. It means the process is centered. Okay, right. Now, these are all I have discussed. And okay, now see. So this is this is called the process operating in three sigma level. When control width is equal to specification width. When your control width and specification widths are the same, it is called that time process is operated to be operating in three sigma level. Now, even a process is operating in three sigma level, the defect per million is all, almost is equal to 66.800 defects in a million opportunity. Okay. Now, CP is four sigma, process operating in four sigma, this is how is means specification width is this, and this is my customer's requirement. This is my specification. Now I am capable of meeting my customer requirement, even if it is a small variation here and there, process shift. Still, I am able to meet the customer requirement. That is the benefit when you have a good capable process. So if your process is not capable, any shift in the process it leads to defects. A process operating in six sigma level, 
it will be just half. You have this specification width. When specification width, when your control width is just half of specification width, then it is said to be operating in six sigma. That means CP is equal to two. Okay. Now let's let's just do a small. I'll show you an example of process capability. How it is done. Just a minute. Okay, now let's see this. See, I have four supplies supplier A, supplier B, supplier B. Now, see what is the process capability of supplier A? Go to stat, quality tools, process capability analysis, normal. Now we'll select a supplier, and uh, since it is an individual data, I'll put it as one. Now it will ask me what is the USL specification LSL. My LSL is 35 mm. My USL is 45. And when I do a capability analysis for supplier A, see this. See this. Now what does mean it say is that they go. So this is the one LSL. What is your LSL? Okay. What is your target? We are not given the target. U USL. Now there are 40 data. Now sample. Uh, uh, sorry, there are 25 data, and your mean is 40. Now there are two standard deviation overall and within. Now within is the one we are going to take. It is 3.8 seven. Now if you if you uh, multiply uh, divide. 10 divided by 6 into 3.87, you get this 0.44. Same 0.44 what we have got. Okay. Now, see here, sorry, not PP, CP. See, 0.43 CP. Now, see, CP and CPK are same here. Isn't it? And CPL and CPU, if there will be any difference, then you will come to know which CP or CPK to be taken. Now, see another important thing. See how many defects that this process is going to create. You see, this is USL and LSL, and where is their control limits? Control limits are crossing this USL and LSL. Now, this such a process, what is an expected defect that it is going to produce in a million PPM? Out of million parts per million, you are going to produce at least one lakh sixty thousand parts are supposed to be defective with this kind of process this is what we analyze in a capability analysis okay now let us take a capability analysis of supplier b capability analysis normal supplier b and everything is same now you see see the difference between supplier a and b now supplier a was crossing the usl and lsl now see the usl in this supplier has not crossed see this control width this control width is well half of the specification width almost now you see this is more than a six sigma capable process see the cp cp is equal to 2.59 now here what is this cpk if cpk and the cp is not equal what does that mean Process is not centered. Not centered. Now tell me towards which side this is shifted? Lower or upper? Upper. Upper. How C? Now I said there you have will have two measures, CPL and TPU. Now out of this, whichever is less, CPU is less. So your CPK will become the lesser one will become the CPK. So here we will not say my process capability is 2.51. I will say my process capability is 2.43. It's a good process capability because anything above CPK 1.33 is a good process. 
Now CPK is 2.43. My CPK is process capability is process capability index is 2.43. Now this is not a big shift. Of course, there is a small shift, but still we can say this is towards upper. Means whatever less towards that, it is shifted. So slightly it is shifted to upper side. Now see the PPM. What is the PPM? Zero. That in an overall performance, this process with this kind of process, I can say I am sure that they are not going to produce any defects. So I can blindly select this supplier because I am confident now the thing that coming that product getting from this supplier, they are not going to produce defects so that it will not come to me also. So OEM is satisfied. Okay. So this is all about process capability. So so yes. uh, may you please explain that CPK is less than ZP that was confused. Uh, I didn't get your question. What is that? So may you please explain that why CPK is less than CP reason. Why CPK is less than? In this case, yes. And when it is equal. Uh, see, you know how CP and CPK is calculated? The formula, yes, you know? Yes, sir. So now when you calculate, see, nobody is setting this. This is what I said. When I say USL and LSL is given, that customer is setting. Now, who is setting this control limits? It depends upon process. Yes, nobody is setting, isn't it? Now, I got a data, real-time data, see. I got a data of supply D, isn't it? Now the CP, CPK, standard deviation, everything is from this set of data, yes, isn't sir. it? What is yes, the first sir. set of data? First thing is I am finding the mean. If I am doing it manually, some 20, 30, 25 years back, if people are doing it manually, what will they do? They will first take the standard deviation, mean of this, isn't it? Then from the mean, they will take the standard deviation. So they got mean and standard deviation. From the mean and standard deviation, they will take the control limit. And they will find out the specification limit. See, you have uh, USL and LSL given by supplier. Yes, no, no, sir. customer clear. Now, yes, where do you get this UCL and LCL? From the actual data. Now, when from the actual data we are calculating things, this calculation we will get the calculation result. Now, what is uh, CP? CP is equal to USL minus that means specification weight divided by six into standard deviation. Now we got it as two point five one. Okay. Yes. Sir. Now CPU. What is CPU? How do you calculate CP? We have calculated. This is CP. Now CPU is calculated as USL minus mean divided by 3 into standard deviation. Now USL is 45, mean is 40, divided by 3 into standard deviation. What is the supply of these standard deviation? 104 something? Yes, sir. When you calculate this, you get CPU as something, and when you calculate CPL, CPL is mean minus mean minus LSL divided by three sigma, three standard deviation. When you calculate it, you got CPL as 2.43. Now you got somewhere here 2.56 uh, 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 something. Let's see what is that. What do I get here? Yeah. We have to uh, take the minimum. Uh, we have to take the minimum. C CPU. You get CPU as 2.59, CPK as 2.43. Now, which one you will take as real capability? Take the minimum. 2.53. Now, this is this is showing that CP and CPK is not same. That means process is slightly shifted. Now, where yes, do you that, slice? Yes, that, now, that's one only. I am uh, confused about where now, it is so, shifted. Yes. So CPU is less. That is why we say that CPU is shifted towards upper side. Is it clear now? Okay, sir. 
that dotted line is uh, indicating the shift is it sir that dotted line is indicating the shift is it no 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 sorry 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 no don't you are confused not that the dotted line is not indicating the shift dotted line what is it given this is called overall that means this line is overall and this line is within that means this dotted line is from the actual calculation now this this line overall overall is something called a long term like that is called ppk like pppp pp is calculated from this okay so overall calculation will be different why why we are taking pp pp is calculating for example you have a new new process suppose you have a new supplier like for example tata some around 10 years back when they started this tata nano they have created everything new they have selected new supply they have selected new engine new design new you know totally new traditional of all new nothing was traditional at an ano everything was new now we need to have new supplier also now when a supplier is uh, making a new product it's called pp pp this something like that you know so auto industries do that what what they do is they just uh, select a new new process newly set process they run it for a short term and based on the short term they have to predict for the long term so that time we take the pp okay so these two lines so specifying this you got two one no overall over a period of time this will be your standard deviation and there is some different calculation for that but this is from actual data from the actual data they take a prediction of okay over a period of time if this is running this is going to be your okay okay sir that is the two lines okay clear okay. okay so this will be clear when you do a green belt or black belt more because when we do the practice with this real case studies when you also collect and do it in mini tab then you will learn more about it okay All right okay sir okay this is how the cross this is done now one more thing now this process capability is for continuous data now suppose we have some discrete data counts like number of defects number of uh, no defective etc there you will use dpmo as your process capability okay we can have dpmo also defects per million opportunity as well as actual measure and cp cpk for A measurement data. Now let's understand how DPMO is calculated. For DPMO, before that, let's understand few things. Like one is called defects. Then defectives. Then you know opportunities, etc. now yesterday i said uh, last week i said to iman shu okay i will give you this time saturday also training that i was supposed to give you a saturday yesterday also training but uh, what happened yesterday some other training program happened and i went to diana and there is a, a company which is ma manufacturing blankets now they are starting implementing six sigma so i was i went to train them now they they have a prop like they have a blanket now this blanket they have so many defects in this blanket okay now you understand what is defects defects and opportunities now they have around eight opportunities let me see what are the opportunities for that just a minute <clears throat> see they can have defects like a weaving a defect now this is a defect weaving defect one defect knitting defect stain size variation torn hole press are by so many so many defects see if any of this defect happen in that come uh, that blanket they will reject that blanket okay so what are this uh, by weaving defect knitting defect stain size variation 
okay but similarly they have how many how many defects they have around from 4 to 21 that means around the 70 70 defect opportunities they have okay so they have how many defect opportunities in how many ways that blanket can go uh, rejected 70 days isn't it yes sir now what is this 17 this is called defect opportunity defect opportunity so same blanket can go in 17 days that can be rejected in 17 days now defects what is defects now suppose i have inspected one this blanket now i found that there is a weaving defect here there is a knitting defect here there is a torn hole here and there is a stain here. Now, how many defects? One, two, three, four. How many defects? Four defects. Now, there are 17 ways it can go, but out of this, I got four. Now, how many defect is? What is defectives? How many defectives? So now one best one blanket I have inspected. That means it is nothing but defective unit. Now one blanket I have inspected. Out of that I got four blankets. Now suppose I inspect some fifteen blankets. So out of fifteen blankets, maybe I may reject some three. I got three blankets rejected. In that three blanket, I have around the 12 defects. You understood this now? What is defects and what is defectives? Defective means one particular unit. In one defective, you can have one or more defect opportunities. From out of 17 ways, you can have one or more defects in the same blanket, same piece. So you should understand what is defect opportunity. What is defect? What is defective? So defective is nothing but how many pieces you have inspected and how many uh, units rejected. So that means uh, that is called total number of number inspected divided by the total rejected divided by total number inspected. Okay, that is a PP. Now suppose if I want to see if I if I uh, inspected 15 15 units. And out of 15, I got defects. See, this is very, very important because later in control charts also, you are going to use the same thing. There will be a separate control chart for defects and there will be a separate control chart for defectives. Sometimes people want to control the defect. Like yesterday, their, their company, they are interested in controlling the defects. They want to reduce total defects. Sometimes some company is not interested in total defects. They are interested in total number of pieces rejected. So it depends which control chart you will use. So defect and defectives are two different things. Okay. Now what, let us see what is DPU. DPU, defects per unit. So it's saying very simple, defects per unit. Suppose I inspected 15 units. That means out of 15 units, if I get 12 defects, so what is my DPU? Can you calculate? Please. 12 divided by 5, 15. Somebody? Point, point eight. eight. Okay, point eight. Okay. So is equal to point eight. So my DPO is point eight. Now what is DPO? Defect per opportunity. Suppose I have inspected 15 and I got 12 defects. But out of 15, how many ways I can, can go wrong? What is the total the opportunity then? 15 into 17. Isn't it? So if I do like this, 12 divided by 15 into 17, so I get the DPO. That means 0.8 divided by 17. Can someone tell what is that 0.8 divided by 17? 0 0.04. 0 0.04. Now you understood what is DPU, what is DPO, what is defects, what is defective units. Now. What is DPMO then? We have been hearing Six Sigma means 3.4 DPMO. What is DPMO then? 
it is the vex per million opportunity so if you multiply a million with a dpo you get dpm that means 0.04 into okay 1 million how much it comes 40000 40000 so your dpmo is 40000 understood so this is our dpmo so with a dpmo what is the what is the six sigma dpmo for six sigma capable process 3.4 3.3 so 3.4 is the dpmo for six sigma capable process whereas what is the dpmo of this 40000 is it okay now let's see so you understood what is the unit defect defective defect opportunity defects per unit defects per opportunity all you have understood now same example in a similar way where there is a shirt now this shirt can go in eight different way so these are all opportunities okay eight pos defect possible defect opportunities and suppose if i select 15 shirts to sell uh, uh, inspected now out of this i found that how many defects so i got seven units defective okay and out of seven units i get how many defects i got 10 defects okay so what is the dpmo dpu dpmo like out of dpu is total 10 defects i received out of 15 units and there are 18 pos eight possibilities so 10 divided by 15 is equal to 0.67 and now this is dpu and if you divide it by opportunities it becomes dpo and then if you multiply by million it becomes dpmo so with the, with that example this dpmo is 83.8 83000 now what is the sigma level for this process so that is understand that see this is the if a process is operating 1 plus minus sigma so your average accuracy is 30.23 and you are going to produce almost 697 6.97 lakhs of defects if your normally process operates between 3 sigma to 4 sigma earlier it used to be 3 sigma but nowadays people are operating even in 4 sigma also okay now if it is 3 sigma your accuracy is 93.3 and your dpmo is around 66800 if you are operating in 4 sigma capable your dpmo will be 6214 so if you are 5 sigma capable then your dpmo will be 233 and 99.3 now if you are 6 sigma capable your accuracy will be this much here this much and here cp will be 2 here cp will be i think 1.33 here cp will be 1 this is how i don't remember what is cp for the five okay <clears throat> clear right now there is one more terminology called the yield yield is nothing but what is first time passed and what is uh, how many pieces goes into a process and how many process goes out of the process so that is just simple if one process goes 90 100 pieces things goes to a process and the 90 passed out then your process this process yield is 90 divided by that means 90% now from here 90 goes to here and 80 that means 100 gone out of a process and 80 only came out good that means here efficiency is yield is just 80% now you will uh, deal with the yield more in your process chemical industry chemical industry i think yield is also very good uh, you know important metric yield people they are talk about yield of 99% etc because your yield will uh, give a small increase in decrease in yield a lot of cost will be involved in your raw material so raw material cost yield is also very very important okay so that's all for uh, uh, this measure phase now measure phase is complete now let's go quickly to the analyze phase any doubt so far 
closer everything is clear clear so we can go to uh, analyze phase and we'll try to finish it analyze and uh, uh, control today okay right so in the analyze phase now well let's let me explain you once again the complete process what is six sigma how six sigma is implemented six sigma is implemented by project by project approach a good company will always have the improvement projects running into that company is even a small company if it is good they can do at least 100 projects now a qc projects will save you at least uh, 4 lakhs 2 lakhs to 4 lakhs 2 to 4 lakhs per annum and a six sigma six sigma project may save you some 50 lakhs to 3 crores Suppose your company is running Six Sigma and you feel it's a small company and at least 20 projects running in a year. Minimum to minimum, they can save uh, when you know, 50 lakhs into there. Almost they can save 10 crores. Okay, that is the power of Six Sigma. Continuously saving cost, you know, improving the performance. Now, six in is a project by project approach. So, how will you do? You do as the DMIC approach, methodology. DMIC. There is a methodology. Now, in the defined phase, if you want to select a project, what do you do? You select a project by brainstorming and then making a proper problem and mission statement and putting them into a charter and getting that approved by the top management. Once it is approved, then we go to the measure phase. In the measure phase, we analyze. What are the causes of the problem? And then we will find most relevant causes and then we'll go for data collection. And we also do capability analysis. Data collection, capability analysis, everything we do in the measure phase. Once we get the data, sufficient data. Now next is analyzing this data to find out what are the root causes. Then once you find out the root cause, then you implement a solution. Once you implemented a solution, you ensure that things are again in the control, new control. So this is the process. So we have completed define and measure. So this, these three phases are very easy, fast moving, fast going. Okay. So uh, there are tools here. We'll discuss about tools and small brainstorming, then control phase. Now, okay. So this is how the analyze phase, see the funneling. See, in the measure phase, we identified the process maximum. See, we say that in the measure phase, you try to find out maximum. Don't miss anything. When you are going, if you are going, coming with me for a green and black belt, you are going to take a project. So in that project, you are going to do this. And in the measure phase, you try to find out maximum causes for that particular problem. Maximum causes. Now, and then collect data for that. After data, in the analyze phase, we do a data analysis and then we come out with the main root causes. It may be one, it may be two or three. So out of eight, we find out what are the real root causes that is causing them. So this is the job of analysis phase. So analysis phase, since it is a yellow belt, there is no much statistical tool. But otherwise, there will be a lot of statistical tools in analysis phase. So cause and effect diagram, it can be used in the uh, measure phase also. Pareto analysis, categorized, stratification, histogram, regression, box plot, etc. These are the yellow bell tools. Okay. Then hypothesis testing, I will I will just touch it because these are all uh, black belt concepts, green belt and black belt concepts, uh, p-value and all. So just I will touch it. Then so cause and effect diagram, you all know what is cause and effect diagram. So it is about uh, uh, you are asking uh, the cause, causes of a problem and then trying to put it in a graphical method. It's a graphical method, also, but very powerful tool. You know, if you do it very good, then it's a very useful tool. So it's a graphical tool, you know, to uh, you know, categorize the causes into particular heading. This heading can be by 5M. It can be 5M also or your own heading. Like if you want to put the causes into adding of manpower, material, method, machines, etc., you can do it. Otherwise, you have your own way of 
classify. Okay, so this is how it is done. Now let's just see how it is conducted. Now uh, uh, this is how it looks. There is a main main arrow, and at the end there is a. Now what is this? This is called the effect. This is the effect. Your effect is nothing but the CPQ or the Y project Y. Now, because we are finding out the reasons for this problem, CPQ is your problem. Now, you want to find out the causes for that. Now, you will have one CPQ and you will have so many causes, and you want to just put it logically. Okay. Now, for example, uh, uh, there is a low engine power. And you can categorize one of the reason as fuel starving, and you can group it as into engine. Now I said you can use either 5M or your own way. Now they have used it in their own way. Okay. Now for example, there is a problem called low engine power. Now team has brainstormed, and they said, okay, it can be fuel starving, it can be bad tuning, it can be speed loss, it can be temperature raise. So many brainstorming points. Now, after this brainstorming points, what you will do, you will logically put this into a sequence so that it can be identified or discussed during the team meeting. Now, all these things, fuel sharing, bad tuning, speed loss, etc., can be classified as a major heading called engine. Similarly, you will have so many, all those brainstorming points you will put it. And then all the team will sit and they say logically, is it logically correct? Can temperature raise affect the low engine power? Can speed loss affect the low engine power? Can bad tuning affect it? So by sitting it, we can say, okay, bad tuning can engine affect the engine. So with the process knowledge, okay, we we'll say there is a we can take this as one of the one of the costs. Now let us do an experiment. Let us collect data like this. Okay. So similarly, it work as mileage. So there, somebody did this and see this. Now, whatever the end of the end of something is considered as a root cause. For example, so uh, one of the category grouping was for this fuel, uh, poor mileage was machinery. So out of the machinery, they have told that fuel fuel uh, mix too much. Now. See this. This is machinery. Now, in the machinery, there is uh, one called under-inflated tires. So, what is the reason for this? This is because no record of the tire pressure. See, this is how it is done. See, they will brainstorm. Why poor mileage? You can do it by why by also why by analysis. What is YY analysis? YY analysis says that if you ask five times why to any your problem, you will come to the root cause. Okay. Similarly, once if you ask this, ask a YY. Why, why poor gas means? Because poor machinery. Why poor machinery? Poor machinery means the vehicle itself. Okay. Why? It, because the under inflated tire. Why tires are underinflated? Because there is no record of tire pressure. So this is one of the reasons for it. So similarly, you can do uh, here also. For why to our gas mileage? So because of poor material. What is that? What is the material? Improper lubrication. Now, what are the improper lubrication? It can be wrong oil. Why wrong oil? Don't know right oil. So no owner's manual. So this can be one of the root causes. So if you do a proper YY -Y analysis to a problem, so it will look like this. It should do, but unfortunately, many of the problems uh, during the problem solving, this kind of a good cause and effect diagram is not made. So when you do make a do, when you do a project, so I'll be uh, insisting you to do a correct cause and effect diagram because it seems to be a very simple. But if you use it, it's very powerful because most of your causes can be identified here. This one. Do not skip it. Do a good brainstorming and do a good cause and effect diagram. Now, Pareto analysis. Pareto also, you all know what is Pareto. Just let me give you the uh, history of Pareto. So, in uh, it was first done by Wilfred Pareto. Now, in, in the 1890s, Wilfred Pareto conducted a study of the national wealth in Italy. Now, he found that 
80% of the nation's wealth is with 20% of the people. Now, Dr. Juran, the quality guru, he said that this is not only with the money, it is with it's a universal phenomenon. He said 80% of your company business comes from 20% of customer. 75% of problems are caused by 25% of causes. 20% of that item account for 80% of the inventory. So Duran said this is a universal phenomenon. Okay. Now, please, this does not mean exactly it add up to 100. Now, suppose your sales is 100 crores. And you have around uh, 50 customers. Suppose your company has 50 customers. And your turnover is 100 crores. Now, what does this mean, 80 20? It means you can do a data analysis. Almost you will be astonished to find out that. What is the 80% of the business here? Out of 100 crore, what is 80%? 80 crore, isn't it? Now you have 50 customers. What is the 20% of these customers? 10 customers, isn't it? Am I audible? Hello? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So here, this is this is your sales. This is your customers. Now I am not exaggerating. This is uh, this happens. I have done it with many companies. I have found it almost true. It what does it mean? 80 20. That means out of 50 customers, 10 customers are responsible for your 80 percent of your business. Okay. So now, this may not be 80 20, it can be 70 35 also, for example, 85 35 also. For example, it can be 85% of 85 crores of business are done by 15% of this. 15, what is 15% of 15? Otherwise, let's take 25%. Uh, 25% means almost uh, for 12 customers. 12 customers are making 85% of your business. So please do not confuse that 80 20 means exactly both will add up to 20. 80 20 is a uh, terminology used, 80 20. It is also known as Pareto analysis. So these are two different things that is, one is business sales, other one is customer. So 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customer and it is true if you have any company just go and look if you are joining any company just do a Pareto analysis of business there you'll be astonished to find it and it's true so it's a universal phenomena Zuran said it is universal it is with everyone now in quality what we'll use now for suppose we have we have uh, defects of 25,000 no, let's take 20,000 around here. Now, what is 80% of this 20,000? 20, 20, 16,000, am I right? Yes, sir. Suppose your total defect is 21. Now, you have for these defects, you find out that there are some eight causes. Now, if you do a Pareto analysis, you can find out that out of these eight causes, maybe two causes, because of two causes, you have 80% of the problems. Now, what should you do then? Why are you doing Pareto analysis? In that case, that means instead of focusing on all eight, you will focus on these two first remove these two causes so that if you remove these two causes you can remove 85 percent of your problem this is why we do pareto analysis means rather than putting our energy and efficient uh, energy resource time and money into an un non-serious things look focus on serious things duran said this 
serious there durant didn't said that serious and non serious he said vital few and useful many okay durant mentioned this 20% as vital few so this is how it looks like you know so if you find out all the causes then you can see that Uh, like uh, one, two, three. It is individual. We will we will learn it. See, it is an example. We will see. See, for example, now you have as a uh, there is a team that finding out the contributors of waste in yarn manufacturing from. Now these can be the reasons like uh, doffing, wiping, denial change, pack change, breaks, upsets, etc. These can be the. Now how many causes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and others also nine causes. And uh, let us see out of these nine causes, how many percentage? How it is done? It is done this way. First, find out what is the uh, percentage. Okay, total percentage, and then uh, what is the total? And find out the percentage of each. Now this is sixty-two uh, out of sixty-two, one forty. Sixty-two are because of breaks. That means the percentage is forty-four. Now this wiping is contributing twenty three percent. Upset is nine percent. Okay, then we will do a cumulative. Now, for example, first is forty four, second is sixty seven, third is. Now you see these four things. Out of nine, these four causes are four things are causing eighty two percent of the problem. Now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That means four by nine. What is the percentage? What is the percentage? Point four four. Twenty. Okay. Suppose twenty four percentage of causes. It's not twenty five. I think it's nearly four. Whatever it may be. So forty four. So, forty four. Forty four. Let's say forty four. Forty four percent of the causes. Forty-four percent of the cause, forty-four percent of the causes is contributing eighty-two percent of your problems. Now, suppose, and you can also say almost thirty percent of the process, thirty-three percent of the process. You can say thirty-three percent of the process is contributing to seventy-six percent of your problems. Okay, this is what is now. It is up to you. You want to take this up to here. Are you able to manage these four? To these four. If you are able to remove these four reasons, that means eighty-two percent of your problem solved. Got it? This is what is Pareto analysis. Now Pareto analysis. Let's do in uh, this one. A mini tab. Just a minute. Now I said I have given you examples. This is my li live example. I said that we are conducting live online program, and my customers pay through a payment gateway, and many of the people have problems of payment failure. Many people said payment failure, payment failure. So I just went to that uh, you know, the payment gateway people. I asked them what is happening, why my customers uh, payment is failing. So what they did was they sent me a data, and I was very happy. I said, okay, you given me good data. I can show it in uh, my example. So now, uh, what what I was thinking is, I was thinking it is due to payment gateway problem. But when I analyzed this data, I found something else. So see this. If I want to do a Pareto analysis, lot of time will take. But we can mini tab. Just put this data into mini tab. It will give you the one. So what, let us see this. It is C10. Okay. Now in mini tab, stat, quality tools, Pareto chart. Now here I am going to put the defects in payment failures. Now frequency is my count. Now see. See the Pareto analysis. Now what does this mean? See, my topmost problem is what is the topmost problem? The topmost problem is cancelled by the user. See, maybe that cancel. So you said maybe last time uh, when at the last moment they may be canceling it. So the percentage is the percentage is thirty three point one. 
cumulative is 31. Second is UPA request time or because of network error or whatever, whatever may be the reason. So UPA request timed out. Now that is, now see, one, two, three, three categories are because 80% of this are because of these three things. So if I want to improve anything, if the payment gateway want to improve and something, so what they will do, they will focus on these three things first. Rather than focusing on all other things, I will leave all uh, other things as non-significant. Because first three problems, if I uh, look at that, it is 80% of my problems will be solved. Okay? So this is the use of Pareto analysis. Then uh, uh, this is the same, uh, showing you how to use, uh, do it and draw it. Now we are looking at the vital few. So these are called vital few, these are used. And focus on the vital few, that's all. That's this a record. Now there is another thing called uh, stratification. This is also a simple tool. Stratification means you are finding, you have a problem, and then you find out the reasons for the problems in a different, different way. That is called stratification variable and stratification values. Now, uh, okay. Uh, suppose there was a problem uh, in a bank. There is an error. Uh, no, the error in the application processing. Now they just wanted to find out what are the reasons for that errors. Okay. Now what they did, they did, they stratified it in three ways. One is they did because of the type of type of account, type of account. Now there are two types of accounts: savings and current and then they have seen as a person there are three person dealing the person a person b person c now then they have stratified it in a shift also shift a shift you know morning shift and afternoon shift now there are suppose there were around 50 errors now first they have stratified with the type so saving and current now, out of 50 errors, now 26 were saving and 24 was current. Now, there are three percent. Now, out of 50, person A, B, C. And then we did another analysis based on the shift. Morning shift, afternoon shift. Now tell me, what is your analysis in this? There are 50, 50 errors, application errors. And this 50 application errors have been stratified using uh, type of account, type of account, person opened account, and uh, shift. Now tell me what do you what do you uh, uh, conclude in this? Which one is more significant? The shift one. Shift one. Shift one. You know. See. Now, saving account and current account. There is no much difference. And similarly, person A, B, C, if I classify this errors into percentage, but if I see this shift wise, there is a major, there is a statistic, I mean, it's not statistics, I mean, there is a significant difference between this and this. So later they found that in the afternoon, there was a cricket match, uh, no, uh, World Cup match going on. In the afternoon shift, it happened. So people, while doing the account of uh, work, they also watch the uh, cricket match. And then this error happened the, on, by the people who have done it in the afternoon batch. Okay, the same people when they did it in the afternoon batch, that means so it was because of the shift that was there. So then they found out the root cause. Now suppose my question is, now suppose this shift would have been, 
like this, will you say is there any significance? Suppose this is like this. Okay. Will you say is there any significance? How will you say that there is a significance? Now I have made deliberately made a big slide. Now you can say there is a significance. Suppose this two, which is more significant? Second one. Second one. So if someone says second one is more likewise. Now I will I uh, see how can I quantify the significance? Now this is totally subjective person to person and if i put suppose if i put this in a different different uh, graph different uh, x and y axis this is in different x and y axis i can deceive you isn't it i make this graph with different x and y axis and i make this graph in different x and y so if you see and you may say that okay this is significant so there is a term called hypothesis testing so in hypothesis testing you get the significance, statistical significance. Okay. You get the statistical significance, a p value. You will get a p value. And based on p value, you say that whether it is significant or not. Now, this, this seems to be a significant. Of course, there is a significance. But always you cannot say the significant using a graph. So, statistic, statistically, uh, we have statistic. Um, uh, tools to find out whether this significance is statistically significant. Now, this will be covered in Greenberg and like that. Okay. Statistical significance. Hypothesis testing. Okay. Now, there is one more uh, tool called correlation and regression. So, you have two things, two, two variables, and uh, if you want to find that code, there is a correlation. Uh, between and you will find it many many correlation between when in a chemical industry you can find it a lot of this tool will be useful in a chemical industry when you do the project so correlation you are finding out if these two variables are correlated to each other so if there is correlation between two variables there can be three cases like it can be positive it can be negative it can be no correlation suppose there is x and y if x and y is correlated, we can get a graph like this. Now, what is this correlation? Positive. It's a positive. That means every increase in x, there is a this in y. So, co correlation regression is covered in your uh, uh, chapters. You learn it earlier. Then I will not waste time. That's why I want to. Yes, sir. We have no, sir. You don't know. Okay, then uh, then leave it. Why to explain it? So you know about correlation coefficient also. R value. What is the R value? Any idea R value? Coefficient correlation. It can be minus one to plus one, isn't it? Remember. Yes, sir. What is minus one? Minus one means perfect negative correlation. What is first one? It is perfect positive correlation. So if you get anything between 0 0.6 to 0.8, we say a B correlation. And anything above 0 0.8, we say it is a strong correlation. Okay. And if it is zero, there is no correlation. Below this, there is no correlation. Let's do an example, for example. So this is the thing. See, it is like this. So you can get a strong positive, strong negative, weak positive, weak negative, and no correlation. Okay. Suppose there is a you know um, uh, problem solving approach with a solder temperature and defect rate. A team wants to know whether there is a correlation between defect rate and solder temperature. Now, if you do this. In mini tab, now let's see correlation. 
Now, if I want to see a scatter problem, we can go to graph scatter plot. Now, simple. Now, tell me what is I have already written y and x. So, what is the y here? Effect rate, isn't it? Output y and x is solder temperature. And if you put this, it will give you result like this. Now tell me what is the kind of relation here? Correlation? Is there any correlation? Negative. Negative. Is it strong or strong or weak? Strong. 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 Okay. By saying it, we can say it's a strong, but somebody will say, no, it's a weak. I don't see any correlation. So how will you quantify it? So for this, we have correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient, you can do it in Excel. Just take all the factors, all the, both the values here. Go to Excel. Mini tab also you can do, but many things in Excel it's very simple. So if you want to find out a correlation between this scatter diagram is one thing that is a graphical representation, but how will you quantify it? So to quantify you can find out the correlation is equal to correlation, and uh, it asks for two arrays. So one is this is one, comma the other one. Now tell me what is the correlation here? Coefficient here. What does this mean? Strong negative. Strong negative. Strong negative. Okay. Why? Because it is above point eight. So and negative is there. So it's a strong negative correlation. Okay. So then we can say, okay, these two things are related. Now, if two things are related, we can use a regression analysis to find out a formula. Also, we'll not discuss regression analysis. Uh, that is again we'll discuss in black window. Okay, so this is one R1 plus one impl implies a perfect positive correlation, negative one, negative correlation, zero means no correlation. So regression equations like y is equal to a plus bx. Uh, again, Minitab will give you that. If you want to do that, go to Minitab. So same thing if you want to do a regression analysis, go to regression, best fitted line plot, and put y and x. OK, so you get the same graph with the another. See, you get the same graph and with a fitted line plot. Now see, this is the equation. If you want to find out what is the best temperature, best uh, temperature to reduce the defect rate, you get an equation also. Now, this is what is R square? R square is square of your R value. What was the R value we got? Minus point Minus point zero nine. And if you just double it, double it, what is that? Square it. How much you will get? Minus, uh, sorry, plus point eight. You get this, huh? 92.8. Point nine is nine six something, no? If you square it, point nine six, you get this. So yes. R square is R square is nothing but square of your R value. And what does it mean that you can predict 92 percent of the uh, output using this line? There, there can be error, error of around eight percent, but 92 percent of the data can be produced with nine this much accuracy. Okay, okay. Now, box plot. Now, do you want a five minutes break? Is it okay? Yes, sir. Is it okay? Then we can proceed. Otherwise, okay, sir. Okay with everyone now? Is it okay so far? Right. So, let's go to the box plot. Box plot is again a tool for an analysis phase where you compare two things when we have small set of data. And we also learned that there are other things like uh, center, uh, center tendency. The best measure of center tendency is mean, isn't it? 
but there is another metric called median percent of that okay so when you have small set of data like uh, you know uh, comparing two teams etc so you can use median as other measures so box plot is a tool which is using median and the different quartiles of data okay so let's see what is box plot uh, it's again studying the pattern of variation especially good when working with small set of data okay so for example there are two teams now two teams now here uh, team a response time uh, in minutes by two maintenance team of the company now this is team a now this is team now if you see this all of a sudden you won't you won't get any any information as i said the best way of describing a data is just to put it in the ascending order so when you arrange the data in the ascending order see all of a sudden you get two three information at a, at a time like team a as 35 team a as 35 minute is their lowest performance and 335 is their highest performance team b it's 92 is the lowest performance team c and uh, team b as 269 as lowest performance now tell me which which one is better by seeing this can you say which team is better it's not easy isn't it so what we'll do we will just do a box plot and see now for box plot what are the things that you have find you want to find the middle value 50% of the now this is the middle value now 50% of the data lies below the middle value and 50% lies above the middle value that is one thing then you have quartiles also like where, where is the 25% of your data lies where does the 75% of your data lies okay and this way you can find out a comparison now like in box plot what we are doing we are just putting like team a the lowest is it is 35 actually and uh, okay so then you put the quartiles what is the first quartile second quartile etc now this is the performance of team a and team b now tell me which team is better team b yes team b because why what is the reason they have they have a consistent performance isn't it of course team a came in 35 minutes for once but team b is more consistent in their performance isn't it they have less variation their variation is their mean uh, uh, no uh, uh, ranges between 102 and, and 279 like lowest performance lowest response time was 102 minutes but the highest response time is 271 there is so much variation and uh, what is the median value there is median average the average response time is 190 minutes whereas here the average response time is 247 now they have uh, the, the uh, 25% of the quartile first quartile has 207 and they have the first quartile at 100 here second quarter is 222 so this is how box plot is used box plot is used for identifying comparing two sets of data two teams uh, with the help of uh, you know to study the variation as the data set is various so that the box plot can be used when you do some analysis when you do some problem solving and you want to compare like this is before this is after when can you compare two teams two processes that time also you can use box plot now i said hypothesis testing i'll cover just hypothesis testing uh, where it is used for example in defined phase we prioritize the problem select one for improvement measure phase we found out various causes 10 to 15 causes analyze phase we come out with a out of this 10 15 causes uh, with the data analysis you found that these two or three can be the root cause now you are doing it in the analysis with the help of data of course no doubt but even then can you predict that these are the real root cause of course you are validated from the data But even then, can you say this is under percent? This is a thing. Can you say that? 
suppose you found the root cause suppose you found the causes of some problem and you are going to implement a solution for it but until unless after 3 months 4 months 1 year this solution is implemented and regularly data is collected well, maybe three months you will find out some data six months you will find out some data for, this, for example okay can you come to know what is what well, you know well, uh, can you predict 100 percent now that these are the root cause especially this will happen with many of the policies now government is taking many implementing many policies a lot of policies you have seen in last six months taken by the government good initiatives good policies but all these policies, the effect of the policies will come after a some time, isn't it? Now, how will the government take decision now? They have to take some decision now, this policy. Similarly, any company, strategically, if they want to take some decision, today they want to take decision. And the result of that decision will come after five years, maybe 10 years, uh, depending upon the, how long-term those decisions are, how strategic those decisions are. So today I found something important and I am going to take a step as decision, a policy making now. How will I take it? Because I don't know exactly what will happen after five years, but I have to take the decision now. Similarly, I find that 10 to 15 critical access out of this, I got two to three critical access, but are they real root cause? I will come to know only after some time, so after implementing, after implementing, what kind of things happen? Either you get a result, either you get an improvement, or it becomes worse. These two things can happen. That means it was a success, it was not a success. These two things can happen. So, there is always a risk. Now, imagine the risk, like we have found a root causes, but it's not that the company has to put a lot of money for changing the layouts and etc. How will you take that risk? So every person needs these risks should be reduced less. So there comes the hypothesis testing. Now there are two scenarios. Now you have found that these are the two, three root cause based on the data. Now after that, there can be two scenario. Now that they are the real causes, like they are really they are, but they are not the root cause. These two things happen now. We don't know what is right. We are validated with the help of data, no doubt. But still, there is a chance, there is a risk, isn't it? Now, what is your decision? You can have two decisions. You decide, you check, okay, decide. You, you reject, you can either reject it. No, don't take. Let us not go for this improvement. And there is another thing, you decide, okay, let us go for this. Now, there are risks, isn't it? Now, let us see. They were not the root causes, the real root causes which you will not come now, come to know now. You will come to know only after implementing, putting money, changing the layout, then only you will come to know after three, four months. But today itself, you decided that no, leave it. I don't feel that this is your right thing. Okay, let us leave it. We will not do this. So is there any risk? Is there any risk? I hope I am yes, audible. Sir. Yes, sir. Is there any risk? Yes, sir. Maybe. No. See, they, they, they were not the root causes. And you are should be. So that means they were not the root causes and you are not going to take any action here. That means there is no risk. Okay. Now suppose whatever you have come to know this they are the real see i mean to say real means you will come to know these real things only after after implementing okay now suppose they were the real one they are really the root causes it's like like a, uh, it's like a court case like an innocent the judge is there and judge is hearing the lawyers and there is a person and judge do not know those for this person is innocent or guilty isn't it? Only that person knows. Judge does not know and they, the, the judge has to decide whether he is innocent or guilty. Sometimes what happens? Judge will take a wrong decision based on the lawyers, uh, the evidence, suppose evidence and all. Sometimes what happens? The person may not be guilty. Okay? Similarly. 
so this these things were not the real root cause and then second second scenario is these are the root causes and you decided also you decided means you said to the your top management said okay go ahead let us put the money let us break the changes now in that case is there any risk no risk sir no risk because they are really the really really they are the causes root causes and you are going to implement solution for that now this is called no risk now suppose they were not the root causes and then you decided it. they were not the root causes and then you really decided to go for it put money for it here is there any risk yes here there is a risk isn't it because actually they are not the thing because you did a mistake in the data analysis or you took got a wrong data and you came to a wrong conclusion that they were not the root causes but because of your conclusion your top management said okay go ahead let us we, we are ready to put money hey capital let us let us budget it let us bring a layout change let us come with a new factory new layout they will put lot of money maybe and like 15 lakhs whatever it may be based on some assumptions now there is a risk or not what is the risk money is wasted production loss lot of thing these are the risks similarly they were root causes and now they have we have not decided actually it was us but my top management said no yaar we are not going to put any money in this leave it so is there any risk here yes sir yes what is this risk what is this risk so the process can be further degraded by inaction no this risk is we are losing an opportunity risk of losing a financial gain means if we would have been bringing this change a we a good time opportunity we would have received something now tell me out of these two risks uh, risk which risk will you consider more which risk will you consider more? or uh, decide not to act knowing the real cause this one you mean to say this one this one yes yes okay now this is more risky always statisticians say no problem if you are losing an opportunity even the every management every company every country any uh, government organization uh, no private organization everyone will think that i want to reduce this risk i want this risk to be less and this is called type 1 type 1 alpha alpha risk so it is like this now in the hypothesis statement we say that H one is true, which is true. Null is true, null is false. You accept the null, you reject the null. So it is said that type one error is rejecting a null when it is true. Rejecting a null when it is true is type one error, and not rejecting a null when it is not true. So very simple. Rejecting a null. Rejecting null. when it is true that is called type 1 now if you put not not rejecting a null when it is not true then it becomes type 2 okay so this is called type 1 and type 2 error i just touched the concept it is we will discuss it later in the uh, uh, green and black now statistician says that they prefer this risk to be less than 5% so there is a probability they say that this is an hypothesis thing we say that if p is low then i will take this decision i will reject it this okay so this is how it is done p is low null must flow it is very difficult for even the phd people the people they do when they do phd this is the biggest problem they face that how to write a null and alternate hypothesis and how to select and reject a hypothesis etc 
So we in Six Sigma, we use this to remember when P is low, null must go. When P is low, null must go. That means when P is less than 0 0.05, 0 0.05 is the standard thing we use. It is said that 95% confidence level. I should have more than 95% confidence to take a decision. If my confidence is more than 5%, that means this will become less than 5%. Significance, risk is less than you. If I am more than 95% confident, that means my risk is, it means my risk is less than 5%. Less than 5% means 0 0.05. Then I can take reject another. Okay. So uh, just, just remember this, please no null must go. Uh, it will help you in later so when you do PSC and all. Then you need to learn more statistics. It will be really useful for you. When P is low, null must go. When P is low, null must go means when P is less than 0 0.05, null must be rejected. Okay. Now, this is another thing that we need to understand. As I said, we have two types of data. One is variable. And the other one is attribute. A variable means you have numbers, quantitative data, numbers. Attribute means you have categorical data. So your Y can be, your Y can be either variable or attribute. Similarly, your X also can be variable or attribute. Now your selection of tools depends upon what is, what kind of data of your Y and what kind of data is X. Now suppose your output data is variable and input data is attribute you are going to use ANOVA ANOVA is a tool suppose both are attribute then you are going to use cash square test and if both variable then we use regression analysis we have discussed regression analysis correlation and regression now if type of data is attribute and this is Used, then this kind of tool is used, logistic regression. So in your projects, when you do, you learn this, all this, when you do a project. So in a project, if uh, the, depending upon the situations, your selection of tools, you will decide which tool to be selected. Okay. I will not go into deep of this. Like if you have two products, like uh, two operators, different operators, and they want to find out if, if there is a significant difference between the operator, and we can use chi square here. Similarly, the test, uh, ANOVA. ANOVA is done when you want to find out that there are two difference between difference between two operators. So we will do an example of ANOVA. Now, this is uh, relation ANOVA. See. Now, see, there is a project. I said there is an hydro, um, uh, hydraulic component repair project. They, they want to find that they have two or three operators, operator A, B, C. Now, operator A produced uh, four hydro boosters, and then their leak test conducted. Now, this is the leaks, measurement of leak produced by operator A, operator B. Now, I just wanted to know, is there any significant difference between operator and the mean? Now, can you tell me, somebody can tell me what is the mean here? Uh, please, can you tell me mean of 805, 820? 715, just I'll take it. No problem. Don't worry. I'll take it. Yes, we'll see. Okay, one, two, three, four. Isn't it? Now, I want to find out 
average is equal to average what is the mean of this and let's find out the average of b Okay. Now, one is average is seven eighty three, seven nine thirty one, and seven eight nine. Now, I want to see like uh, last time I said that we, if we are going to put a graph, can we make a graph here instead graph? Graphs. No, otherwise insert. Okay. Now, uh, can we say is there any significance between the operator? Yes. So it seems to be a significant. Now, suppose if this is here, this is here. How will you find out if there is a significance? Suppose this is in eight fifty. Suppose. If it is 850, how will you find it is significant or not? Who will say? Who can say exactly what is the difference? So it is subjective, isn't it? So how do you find out that there is a significance? Like operator A, operator B, and operator C. Now operator seems to be producing more defects, but is there is a significant difference between them? What is the measure of that significance? So let's just see. Do it. Okay. Now go to stat ANOVA, one way ANOVA. Now response is your legs, factor is operator. Just do it. Okay. Now let's see. Now same graph, isn't it? Now it seems to be it seems to be significant, isn't it? Now, how will you find that it is significant or not? What is the quantifying value for that? What is that? I said p-value. What is the p-value here? Point 0.003. Now, tell me, is it less than 0 0.05? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. So, this is how we say significant. If anything is less than 0 0.05, we say that that difference is a significant difference. If you are comparing two process, so you understood how ANOVA use because one is variable data and other one is attribute data. So how will you compare these two? ANOVA is a tool. So what is the result of ANOVA? Well, if you are doing a black belt project, then you will write an analysis for this, interpretation for this. Then you will say, P value is this, none where null statement is this. So we reject the null statement. That means there is a significant difference in the performance between the operator. Now, operator B's performance is a sad statistical significance. Operator B's is producing more defects, more leakage. So we need to have, we need to give special training to them. The operator B's performance should be monitored. And we need to improve his scale, etc. That is action point. Understood? So this is how ANOVA is done. So ANOVA is one tool we can use in analysis phase where you have a variable Y and a categorical X. Okay, with this, we have finished the analyze phase also. Okay. Now the last phase is uh, uh, a solution phase and a control phase. So here we will learn uh, two, one major uh, tool is brainstorming and the other major tool is the four types of control charts, okay? Now, as I said in the analyze phase, we have so many 
excess in the measure phase and in the analyze phase we did a funneling effect funneling effect is nothing but we have used lot of tools and then we have come to a conclusion like in the last case we have come to a conclusion that is operator b is one one reason for this leakage okay now what is the uh, action you can have you can have operator b replace operator with v with some other person or give more training to operator b these are all the actions but you have come to a, you got a significant root causes once you got a significant root cause then your next step is finding out a solution or counteracting your root causes so this is simple that was an operator mistake but sometimes you have a process mistake you have an input mistake you have a you know different uh, input category or input specification process specification etc that time what will you do you need to do a solution select a solution and how will you select solution because you are in a team so you all will sit for a brainstorming of solution selecting the solution for this so here is very very important this activity because you should focus on creativity lot of creativity so brainstorming is one tool for that if you do a brainstorming then uh, brainstorming for solution so let's learn how brainstorming is done so what is brainstorming brainstorming is a tool to generate solution ideas to counteract root causes refine solutions justify uh, sorry this is uh, uh, improve phase basics okay uh, develop an implementation plan etc these are the phase, uh, steps in implementation so brainstorming is one tool for it so let's discuss brainstorming so these are the tools we are going to discuss brainstorming okay okay solution selection and thing piloting etc design of experiment again it is not a uh, yellow belt thing but we will cover it in black belt so brainstorming is a group thing where you can generate large number of creative and useful ideas in short period of time it was first used by alex osborne in 1949 in the name of think up it's a it's very good tool but what happens it's not used properly because of the poor training and we don't know how to use it so if you learn brainstorm do brainstorming it's going to be a good asset for you because when you move at the top you can use brainstorming as one of the tools for your many of the you know problem solving analysis or new new process design system design etc so the rules of brainstorming is no criticism of idea if somebody is giving an idea no they should not criticize and go for large quantity of idea respect each other's idea encourage wild and exaggerated ideas what does this mean wild and exaggerated ideas sometimes ideas out of box yes out of box very good out of box what do you mean by out of box then Okay, we'll cover it. Okay. Uncut. Encourage wild and okay, we'll come to that. Okay. Encourage wild and ex I'll give an example. You know, very long back I read it somewhere. Like uh, there was a brainstorming session for uh, you know uh, ice cream cups. Like once upon a time, this cups of ice cream, people eat ice cream and throw the cups uh, all along. So they the company decided to have something done, some solution for that. Then then they did a brainstorming, and then during that brainstorming, somebody gave an idea why can't we make a cup that we can eat the cup itself so that time everybody laughed on its idea that was a wild idea but later it has become an idea a solution itself like the soft tea it is it is from that solution soft tea ice cream stain where the, you don't have to throw the cups you can eat the cups also and then another one's contribution in turn then uh, allow time to think then one idea at a time pass allowed okay so no explanation no justification when you do explain just take the points when people start elaborating then stop them no don't explain now no justification now just tell me your points note down the point this justification elaboration explanation will be done in the second phase of the brainstorm but the, our idea is getting maximum ideas uh, at a time okay in short period of time so we do a uh, phrase a statement and this should be given uh, well in advance to the team of the participation team 
and then uh, prepare brainstorming session. Ideally, six to eight is a very good. Uh, no more than six is not a good. Now have two or three participants outside the process. Why this? Why this? Have two or three participants from outside the process or issue. Now here comes that out of the box. See, what do you mean by out of the box? We always say that out of the box. What is the meaning of that out of the box? When you say out of the box, when you say box, that means it has a boundary. So when you are thinking in the box, it is boundary that you are thinking as a boundary. So if you are in a process, if you are working in a process, you cannot go out of box because you are always into that process. You are always into that boundary. You know, you know your process well. You cannot think out of this, out of box. It's very difficult because you have that boundary. But a person sitting, person outside the box, person outside, he does not have the boundary. He does not have the boundary. He can think out of box. He may give stupid ideas, wild ideas where your process people cannot do. Understood? This is why we always say, call some two, three people extra who is not in the process. Only they can think wild. And you may laugh, but sometimes it may, it may give you a good result. So provide mark, marker, flips, etc. Okay, the brainstorming step is introduce it. Now warming up. And now one more thing. It's very good warming up. Before the actual thing, just warm up the session. Okay, now for example, we can use, suppose if you want to conduct a brainstorming session here, I'm just having a warming up session. So I'll just ask you, what are the different uses of a rubber band? Yes, one did I, did I conduct this here with this? We, did we conduct a brainstorming, warming up session brainstorming with you anytime? Not yet. No, 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 no. Okay, then you tell the one by one. You tell what are the, what are the uses of a rubber band? Uh, who can tell first? To tie up things together. Yes, that is one point. Somebody else. So I'm just noting down the point. Yes, tell me. Somebody else. One is tying up. So to uh, keep a paper, a sheet of paper rolled. Okay, tie sheet of paper. Okay, that is same as tying up sheet rolls. Okay, then anybody else? Come on, how many people are there here? Almost 70, 60, 70 people are there. Are all of you left? So we have how many brains? 70 brains. Even if you give me one, one, so we have 70 points. Just think, we'll have one minute brainstorm. Are you there? Yes, sir. Somebody else, please give me one more. Oh, we can use them in some artwork. Artwork, very good. We can use an artwork, yes. What else? Just remember your school days. Making a sling. Pardon? Making a sling. Slingshot. Slingshot, yes. In your school, you have done it. Okay. Yes. Then? You see now coming, ideas coming. What else? Who else can give idea? So I have conducted this uh, this rubber band use with so many people, so many times. You know, I have around the 30, 40 ideas. It's not mine. People have given me. I know even I never thought of these ideas, these things. Somebody said you can clean your teeth. 
somebody said you can you can use it as a rubber band you put a, you have a pencil you have a pencil here and you don't have a rubber then you use a rubber band at here and tight and then you can you can use it as a rubber eraser okay then somebody said okay you have a car toy car and your uh, belt broken you can use it as a belt for the toy car okay so so many so many examples so many uses so that is the power of brainstorming so when we do a brainstorming try to conduct a uh, warming up session like some other thing is what are the different public transport you can use public transport uh, that if you want to come from mumbai to delhi what are the transport methods you can use so a warming up is always good before you do the actual brainstorming session okay then uh, brainstorming step if you get the points list down the point ideal time is just 25 to 30 minutes not more than that properly planning you will get very good ideas okay make each ideas noted down understand to all participants combine and group similar ideas you take similar ideas and group it Uh, define criteria for evaluating the ideas then you select narrow down the best ones so similar way if you want to find out some solution to your problems you can do a brainstorming and come to a solution now this is uh, but during this uh, designing of solution you must consider this uh, always mistake proofing okay okay what is this okay okay Okay, okay means mistake proofing. Mistake proofing means, see, uh, in this is a Japanese concept like Shigeru Shingo. See, they say that people can make mistakes. So it is you to design that such a things that people even by mistake they will not make a mistake. Suppose you are um, uh, uh, you are the key for the car or bike or your scooty. Now this key you can put it in both ways, isn't it? Any way you can put it. either side left or right or uh, you know you can put it in both ways but it was not the case some um, when it was actually started like uh, you know car and all the, this keys can go only in one direction now if a key can go only in one direction what happen the people are bound to make mistake the person will uh, you know put it forcefully in the opposite direction there are people who will do this mistakes so to avoid even to avoid a mistake even by mistake so Okay, okay. It's a concept. Whenever you design anything new, think about okay, okay. Mistake proofing. Bring that concept in your designs. So it's the way uh, Shigo Shingo, and uh, it is a technique for eliminating mistakes even by mistake. So there are different types like prevention uh, achieved by control, etc. Machine automatically stops when it detects an error. This is the prevention. Okay, okay. okay then the detention detention means uh, like to signal that an error uh, the error and make a alarm kind of thing something a warning signals to stop the process correct the problem like a uh, alarm or uh, you know uh, hooter like uh, kind of things so there are two rules of okay okay do not wait for the perfect okay okay do it now if you have okay okay idea is better 5 10% than even then you do it do it now improve later that is the concept of okay so draw a lot of examples like all your pc see if you are assembling a pc if you are putting it it will not go in a different direction these are all examples of okay okay electrical sockets mobile sim charts car keys like see even uh, earlier uh, mobile chargers will have different type of so now now comes like apple came with this concept you can put in either way uh, like uh, the today's uh, charger type c charger you put it in either way there is no no chance of making mistake like you you know make it in the, the forcefully you will put now the usb the usb port is not like that but the inside it is like that you know if in usb also we need to have something like that but if you do an hdmi port hdmi port also it will go only in one way you cannot go in other way a pirating means if you find out a solution before actually going for the actual solution do a small test pirating pirating is also part of improvement phase okay then design of experiments design of experiment is 
like uh, when you find out the root causes and if you want to find what is the optimum level of root causes for example i said that i have a batch from singapore so they are bringing lot of projects so one project is regarding the windmill now windmill uh, they it depends upon the speed of the wind output it's a 2 megawatt uh, no 2 kilowatt uh, 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 generator one generator likewise they have around 50 generators now they want to find out what is the best pitch and angle that the generator will produce a output now we can do a design of experiment for this so design of experiment is we are deliberately you know changing the levels of factors and then testing it so there are certain certain uh, terminologies for that uh, uh, design of experiment let's understand what is that the response <laughs> response means there is a output process being investigated represented by y for in this example this windmill project output output is the response output means output of the generator so this target is 2 kw 2000 watt means 2 kilowatt so this is the desired output now uh, output this output is not the project output this output is the uh, definition of that particular megawatt okay output voltage so this is called as response what is that you are going to improve factors now factors is those things that affecting it like there are two things it is affecting one is called angle angle of the generator and the other is pitch pitch of the generator now levels levels are what are the different levels that you are doing the experiment for example in angle they have a uh, 270 280 and 290 so three levels now in pitch they have 1.4 1.5 1.6 now i want to conduct an experiment in this how many experiment i have to conduct if i want to conduct with all the sets how many experiments i need to conduct any idea it is not called as level to the power of factors now you have two factors how many factors here angle and pitch two factors now how many levels of each angle each uh, each uh, factors three levels so 3 to the power of 2 that means if you do nine experiments with the different sets then only you will come to know it's a full factorial experiment then only you can find out an optimum level of factors and levels now there may be 270 may be the best value 1.5 may be the best value so how will you find out you will do an experiment you will set this with the different angles and set then you will find out what is the output of the generator and sometimes you will repeat it for two times so that means 18 experiments you have to do and then based on that experiment you will find out the best value so that is design of experiments now another thing is we have to select a solution once you have two three solutions you will select one best solution okay so that is a solution selection you will have find out so you will sit in a team and then you will find out what is the best solution out of two three solutions so this way you in the improve phase you are finding out the solution then uh, uh, you are thinking about brainstorming you are brainstorming it then coming out with a solution then you are uh, finding out the best solution and then you are implementing it. your solutions are being implemented now comes the control phase now control phase is after implementing the solution you need to you need to maintain a new new control new status quo because for example you have a problem with defects now 25000 defects that i am producing now i have implemented some solution and i have remo removed the reduced the defects now from 25000 i have come out with 500 defects i could maintain it with the 500 defects now i need to control it otherwise if i am not controlling it again things will go back to the same same Format. So control is very very important. Any doubt so far?
otherwise we can proceed with the last phase of six sigma yes sir we can proceed okay so let us go to the control now what is you should understand something here that's called the statistical process control the planning for the control phase so you in the control phase we are developing a control plan and we will learn about statistical process control and you will also learn about control charts now in control phase prepare process control plan implementation control charts okay now visual controls this is also very very good thing many of the factories if you visit there are a lot of thing all these graph charts everything they put it in the visual factory and i even then doing a lean manufacturing competitive schemes for quality comes of india quality comes of india specially specially you know looked into this visual controls they said okay we should display visual management visual control etc so visual control is a very good thing that uh, you can control things by visually you can see that things are going out of control or not so it is just like graphical charts and pictures on board placed near that a good factory will have a very good visual control if you visit a good factory then definitely you will find all those things there it can be graph signboards cautionary because when a buyer comes and see it, it gives a good impression in the buyer yes this company is really managing things well okay and control plan control plan is a document describing the system for controlling the process so it uh, uh, gives you the complete what are the things like for example like uh, uh, uh we give the part number here planned then who is prepared this control image then the activity like for example in that hydrochloric uh sorry hydro uh, hydraulic component repair section these are the two things that was affecting the leaks so these two process they have made a control plan like control plan bell crank fitting during the fitting of the bell crank uh what is the ctp the diameter what is the specification limit it's 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 so what is the gauge to be used who is responsible for this samples who will go check it every uh, weekly you have to take 10 samples and what is that chart that we are going to use individual moving range chart this way most critical things most critical ctps you will have a control plan how to control it how you will control things in the youtube perfect control chart now for control chart you need to collect data now who will collect the data what is the frequency of the data what is the specification of that particular ctp and which chart you are going to use everything matters okay now now comes let us understand what is statistical process control now in the uh, measure phase i said what is the natural control limits of a process what is the natural control limits mean plus minus three sigma yes mean plus minus three sigma so this is also nothing has something to do with our control limit control charts okay now what is statistical process control we learned that variation is law of nature and no production process is good enough to produce all items alike hence controlling a process means nothing but controlling the variation if you want to control a process that means you have to control the variation so there are many ways to uh, uh, you know control the method, controlling methods like uh, historically manufacturing versus statistically controlled spsp techniques have been effectively used in service sector also nowadays so the four basic steps of spsp is measure the process eliminate variance in the process monitor the process improving the process to the target value these are the steps for statistical process control spsc using control charts Commonly used tools in SPC are histograms we use, scatter diagram, regression analysis, process capability studies, and control charts. So we have discussed all these things. Now only control charts are there. So ever tools I have explained except the control charts. Okay, with all these things we have discussed. Now control chart is the one we are going to look at. Now, what happened? Many of the time, even today, people are confused with what is control chart and what is specification traditionally what happens suppose we take that example that uh, same uh, you know crankshaft or something or that we have a 
specification, lower specification 35 mm. Upper specification has 45 mm. And there is a mean called center target called 40. Now, most of the time, the companies, what they do is they always take action when things are here, they won't take any action. Okay. Now, if this cross here, then they take action, then everything is fine. Then one day, if it is crossing here, then they take action. So traditionally, the people take action when it is crossing the specification limit. Now, even today, people think this is control chart. Even good companies also got confused with the control chart. They feel that this is control chart. Now, this is not control chart. This is just your specification limit and this one. Well, then what is control chart? Control chart is like control limits of mean plus minus three sigma. So it said that this is called traditional approach, but Shivat is a person who said that mean plus minus three sigma is a point where you need a control in your process. So control chart says about two kinds of words common cost variation and special cost variation. So control chart will tell you about special cost variation. So let's, let's understand that. For example, C. What is a traditional company do? Now, this is your upper specification 35, lower specification 35, upper specification 45. Now, Say this, 45, 35. Now suppose, traditional company, what they do, they take actions when the process goes beyond the specification limit. But a company which is following uh, SPC approach, what they do is, they take action whenever it is crossing your control limit. Now see, this is not a defect, isn't it? This is also not a defect. This is also not a defect. But this is a defect. This is a defect. Now good company always take action not to wait till it is getting defective. They take before, even before things are going out of control. Before it is getting defective, then they will do actions well before that. That is what meant by control charts. Control charts are used for that. Now, what does this mean? Now, see, when you say this, see, these variations are natural variations, but anything going above the control limit, it's not because of natural variation. Anything. So what is the control limit here? UCL, see the UCL, UCL and LCL. These are the control limit. Anything within the control limit. Now this, 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 this. These are all because of natural, natural variation. But anything goes out of the control limit. This is not natural. This is special. It's not natural. This is special. So this cause is to be analyzed. These are all natural causes. But when, when it is going out of the control limit, these are all not the natural. This is special. So identify the special causes for this, for going out of the control. This is what the concept of control charts. Let me tell you, people do not know, even today people do not know this. Good, good companies also do not know this concept. But it's a very good concept, control chart. Now, how will you do it? There are, what are the types of control chart? There are different types of control chart. Let us see. Now, see. When I was telling you then, uh, about defects and defectives, I said there are two things. Now, defects, defectives. And there are other things called variable and attribute. Variable means where there is uh, data, categorical data, count data. These are all count data. Not, don't confuse with the uh, attribute. This is count data. This is variable data, measurement data. There are measurement data. And then there are count data. 
in the count you get defect and defectives you can count defects you can count defective also that means how many defects are there in one unit or how many pieces rejected and how many defects in that rejected pieces all these are discrete count so you have two two types of chart one is for measurement one is for attribute now how will you use let us see now in the in this chart also you have two things called if you are if you are able to take the data if you are not able to take data in a grouping then you take imr chart and if you are able to take data in a group then we can do two charts one is x bar and x bar s what does it mean x bar r what is this x bar mean mean and r mean what is r what is s standard deviation standard deviation so what is r range when you have less less number of samples standard deviation will not be a good good uh, no will not give you a good combination so that time you will give instead of standard deviation you use range now s is standard deviation okay so you can use s bar x bar s or x bar r wherever grouping is possible now see here it is written imr imr means individual moving range now that means we are going to plot the individual value now here it is x bar r that means x bar means mean so you are going to plot the values of mean and r so if you want to have calculate the mean that means you should have a group of items like measurements like four items are there then only you can find out a mean and a standard deviation or r in this isn't it so whenever measurement data is used you want to do a control there then you will use imr or x bar r but let let us come here now you have two things one is defects and defectives now what is that you want to control defects or defectives so in that case let us see if sample size is constant it's not constant then you can use p chart for defectives u chart for defects now here you'll use np chart for defective c chart for defective uh, defects so you have charts for defects charts for defectives and you have sample size constant or not constant so if sample size is constant np and c chart if sample size is not constant we'll use p chart and u chart don't worry we'll we'll, see. we'll do it very simple and i have already shared this ppt to you okay you can go through it so let me do let me close it now we are going to use this see how many charts are there p chart np chart c chart u chart x bar r x bar s imr now let's first talk about imr where do you use imr when we want to plot it as individual data then we will plot it as imr okay imr means individual moving range isn't it now see this is diameter this is a measurement so it is going to use we are going to use chart for variables now you have 10.06 10.01 9.98 9 9.9 so we will get two charts in imr individual chart as well as moving range chart now we have some around the 50 data so in this 50 data you will get a mean of this value isn't it <coughs> you get a mean or not of this total 50 data is it not you can find out a mean isn't it yes sir okay. yes sir and then what is the range now range is what it will take range as it will take range from each independent uh, adjacent values 
like 10.06 divided by 10.01. So what will be the range here? 0 0.05, isn't it? Now we are going to get a chart like this. Let us go. Stat, control chart. Now what are the what is the control chart? Variable or attribute this? What is the control chart? Variable or attribute? Variable. Now, in the variable, individual or subgroup? Individual. Individual. We are going to do it individual. Okay. IMR. So, see, stat, control chart, control chart, variable, two types of control chart, variable for subgroups, variable for individuals. So, in the IMR, let's go. Now, here, we'll put the diameter double click and then we'll put OK. Now, see, we'll get two graphs. See this. First one is individual value. Now see here it is written x bar. What is x bar means? Mean. mean. So mean of this 50 values is given here. Now LCL and UCL it is done. It is plus minus three sigma. Okay, three standard deviation. Automatically it calculated LCL and UCL. Now you see there is variation, isn't it? Once it is 10.01 individual value, okay, there is variation or not? Yes. So what is this variation? Is this caused by any special cause or a natural variation? Natural. natural. So whatever is happening within your control limit is said to be natural variation. It has to be. There has to be this. Anything happening this is called a natural variation. But anything crossing your control limit is not natural. There is something cost assignable cost there. Now, when you when you analyze control limit, control chart, how will you analyze? You analyze is there any point crossing above or below the control chart, control lines? So you will analyze both the both the chart, individual chart and moving range chart. And both the values should not cross the upper limit. If both are met, then only we say this process is in control. Now tell me, is this process in control or stable? It is in control. It has to be. Now we have to see both the graph. Can you see in moving range any, any red point? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. That means this process is not in control. That means in moving range, one range is going out of the control. So that is sample number 32. Sample number 32, not 32, 32, 33, 34. 34. Sample number 34, the range is going out of control. This is not a natural thing. This is a special thing. This is to be identified. Why it has happened? Is there a tool breakage? Is some skillful person missing that? Some a new person come and do it, done it? A unskilled person, unauthorized person did it? Is it a tool breakage? Is it a machine breakage? You need to analyze because this is not natural. This is something assignable cause here. So this is what is IMR chart. Now we can go to other chart. Next chart we will use is X bar R chart. Now, X bar R. So in the X bar R, what is that? See, all the diameters have been taken in a sample. Like in some sample one, we have four subgroups. So what Minita will do is, Minita will take the mean and range of this. And then it will plot. Earlier it is plotted individually. Now we are going to plot the mean. So what will be the central value then? In the control line, there will be two lines, isn't it? One center and top two lines, top and bottom one one line. So in individual moving range, we have find the middle value as X bar. Now here the middle line will be X double bar. Okay, that means mean of the means. 
So Minitab is going to run, for example, see, we have how many data here? 80 data. And how many samples? It is grouped into four subgroups. That means 20 samples, isn't it? We have 20 samples, see, 13, 14, 20 samples. So what we are going to get is, we are going to get 20 means and 20 ranges. Now, Minita will plot this mean and the range graph for this, control chart for this. Now, let us see. Control charts. Now, again, which one we will use? Subgroup or individual? Subgroups. Subgroup. And then we will go to X bar R. Now, in the X bar R, we will put the diameter and we will put the subgroup here. We can put either four. In the subgroup, you know that this first four are one group. So, either you put it four. Or you give that particular column, both are same. Now let's put this. Now let's go this. Okay. And uh, now see. See this. Now can you see here what is the middle line? Mean of means. Mean of means. X double bar. Hmm? And uh, what is this individual values? This is not individual value. It is a group. First group is four item. Mean of that four. See here. What is the mean? See. Sample one. Sample mean is 10.03. That is the mean of that four items in that sample. So instead of putting 180 individual value, this graph gives you 20, 20 subgroups. Now, is this in control? X bar? Yes, sir. X bar is in control. There is no natural, uh, but there is no assignable cause. All variations are due to natural variation. Now tell me this process is in control or not? No, sir. No. Why? Because the range chart goes out of control. That is, sample number 12 is going out of control. Isn't it? So we'll say this process is not stable. We need to identify why it is possible. Okay. okay. Now let's go to uh, U chart. Now, how many charts are there? P and then P, C and U chart. Now, one is for defects, one is for defectives. Now, P charts are for defectives, means proportion defect. Okay. P stands for proportion. Now, let's see P. Why are we using P? Because we use P when sample size are not constant. Now, for example, say this. How many samples inspected? How many samples inspected? 400. How many pieces rejected? Five. Five. So what is the proportion of rejection or percentage of rejection? Five divided by 400, how much is this? Zero point? Zero point? Zero one two five, isn't it? You know? yes. yes, so this is a proportion defective. Now Minitab is going to plot the control chart for this. Now there is, how many data? We have 20 data. Now we'll have 20 proportion. And we will have an average proportion also. So this way, Minita will plot it. And then, based on that, we will find whether the process is in control or not. So first one is 0.15. So Minita will plot. And here, in control chart for attributes, we have only one chart. Unlike in X bar R, X bar S, there is no two charts. There is only one chart. Now we'll find, go to stat control charts. Now which one I have to use? Tell me. Attribute charts. Attribute. attribute in the attribute. Which chart? P. P. Why P? What is why we are using P? So because sample size is not constant. Yes. Clear. Now let's go to P. Now P here, number rejected. Now here we will put number inspected. And we'll draw this. Now let's see. View. See this. Now, what is the first value? So it was 0 0.0125. 
you know, see this 0 0.125. So this is taken by the proportion. Now we will have a mean proportion. Then we will have a upper and lower control limit. Okay. Now tell me, is this process stable or not? No, sir. No, sir. No, no. no. So that like all other defects are happening is same, but sample number eight, which has gone out of the control. Now tell me one more thing. See the top value of the top of the control chart. Why this is zigzag like? Why it is not a the straight difference line? in the sample size? The sample yes. size is different. So when you see a chart, you will be able to identify whether it is a P chart or NP chart. In P chart, that line will be control line will be zigzag. In NP chart, it will be a straight line. In P chart and C chart, in two charts, you are going to have, see, in P chart, your top line will be like this. Your control lines will be like this in P chart. And in U chart also, U chart also you will get something because in U chart also you have different samples. But in NP, you will get something like this. This is for P chart, upper and lower, and a U chart, upper and lower. But in NP chart, you get straight line. In C chart also, you get straight line. And X bar also, X bar, X, in all you get straight lines. But in P and U chart, you get something like this. So you can identify which is this chart. So, same minute I okay. So, you know, this is now let us go to the other chart called NP chart. Here is where we are using NP chart when you have constant samples. See, now see this you have constant samples. Now you can straight away go to the NP chart now. Start control chart, which, which chart, attribute chart, and then NP. Now, here you write rejected. And here you can either put this column number inspected or you can straightway put it as 200. Because this 200 is constant for everyone. So you just put it as 200 also. Then click OK. Now see this, the straight line. And you can see this process. There are so many assignable causes you need to identify because these are not natural causes. These are all assignable causes, special causes to be identified. Okay. Yeah. Now let's go to the C chart and U chart. What for we are using C chart and U chart? P chart is used for defect or defectives. P and NP. Defectives. Defectives. P and NP charts are used for proportion defectives. How many proportion, how many percentage of pieces rejected? Now, C and U chart is not about a unit rejected. It is about a total number of defects. Now, yesterday, as I said, blankets, they have uh, 3 lakhs of blankets produced in a month. And out of that, they have around 25,000 defects. Now, they are not interested in the defects, blankets, a number of blankets rejected. No, they are interested in how many defects, total number of defects. They want to control the total number of defects. Not a person means when they control the total number of defects, automatically their rejection also goes down. So they want to control the defects. Now in U chart and C chart, we have defects. When you have constant sample, we use C. And when you have constant, uh, not, uh, not constant sample, then use U chart. So let us see U chart. U chart and P chart look similar with the zigzag lines. U chart. Now again, you put one confirm it is, put your sample, and then go to see this chart. Okay. Yeah. So, 
Is this in control? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Is it yes, in control? Sir. Process is controlled. Yes, so whatever variation is happening is because of natural variation. Natural cause. There is no assignable cause. There is no special cause for this. So clear? This is all about control chart. And I have one last, and you see this lines in U chart because sample size is different. What do you mean by U? What is this U? Why they have named this U? U means the defects per unit. It's a chart for defects per unit. It is defects per unit. So that's why it is called U chart. See this. This one. See. You have inspected eight samples. Out of that, you got eight defects. So what is the defects per unit? What is the defects per unit? Eight sample inspected and you got eight defects. Defects per unit is? One. 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 Now you have 17 defects in. Can I do this like this? Divided by, it's equal to 17 divided by unit. Defects per unit, isn't it? No, it's not valid. Many times you cannot do like Excel. So what is 17 divided by? 2.12. 2.12. 2.12. 2. 2. 2. 2. 2. Okay. So this is DPU, defects per unit. And with this chart, plotting this, let us see this. First one is 1, DPU is 1. Second one is DPU? 2.12. 2.12. See, so it is chart of DPU, defects per unit. That's why we call it as U chart. Okay. Okay. So C is also similar like that. You can just go to, we can do the graph for C also, C chart. For the tools. Yeah, do. C chart. Now in C chart, sample size is constant. So Minita will not ask you that sample size also. Only. They'll not ask you because sample size is constant. Attribute chart, C chart. Say this. It's asking only the number. You are going to take the total defects. Okay. Now see. This is C chart. Now all other variations are because of natural variation, but this is not because of natural variation. Okay. And see the straight line at the top. So with this, we have covered all the phases of uh, yellow belt. And uh, if somebody is interested in uh, certification and all, you can come to know. Otherwise, you can go for that our certification program, and we will be uh, the next. We are planning the certification program, green belt and uh, black belt. So I think you can straight away go for that. And uh, then you will be having more uh, you know, projects. Then you are going to take, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are going to give you mini data examples. Then we'll take projects. There is a project evaluation. Then more tools, hypothesis testing, statistical testing, statistical tools. More tools we'll be dis uh, discussing design of experiment, etc. With the real time uh, case study and your own project. Now for yellow belt, this is the level normally done, and I have covered even more than yellow belt also. But since you are in uh, exam mode, I have not uh, given much uh, practices for you because it will be too much hectic for you. So when you get time, then we can plan for green belt and black belt with the proper, and that will be part of your internship like kind of thing. So thank you very much. Now we can uh, you know go for questions. Any questions you have? If anyone have any questions, please ask to sir with your name and your college name. Anyone have any doubts?
एनीवन सर आई थिंक नो वन हैज एनी डाउट सर ओके सो थैंक यू वेरी मच and uh, let's be in touch anybody has any doubt you can uh, have my number reman should you can share my number okay any time sure, you sir. can come and ask me okay any time and if you are doing in even in future also so i'll be very happy if you come out with a um, doubt going implementing it practically if you see let me tell you this is one of the uh, you know the most sought after certificate in industries every industry is looking for this certificate and if you are taking a green belt or black belt especially black belt you will be considered better than others because you already have a concept of problem solving people organization want people like you who knows the problem solving they they want everyone want that the people their resource is solve this problem themselves okay not by your manager because top management need time to do many thing else so there should be capable people who are solving the day to day problem so a great black belt knows how to identify an opportunity how to solve it systematically and how to control it this is the first stage because when you go you will be using the technical knowledge and later when you grow up the top of your organization then you will learn how to manage this project if you are managing a project and you are saving at least 5 uh, to 10 crores for the company so imagine the value uh, you have in that company because company respects two people one is sales people who is bringing sales to you they love you because they who are the people who are bringing sales so sales team get all attention everybody will listen to sales team because they are the people who are bringing the sales and the second people who people company loves is the person who is reducing the cost because to reduce a cost to get a cost saving of 10 crores you need to have a sales of at least 100 crores so it is like if you are saving 10 crores that means you are like it is like you are bringing 100 crores sales okay so that is the kind of uh you know attention people now give for the problem solving cost saving and it's not uh, the job yesterday as i said that company one problem is causing them at least 70 60 70 lakhs this defects problem is causing them 60 70 lakhs if they are able to reduce the defects from 25000 to 500 defects they are going to save at least 60 lakhs 60 lakh saving means at least 6 crore sales minimum so that is the use of this certification that is the use of this uh, knowledge implementation so use it in your day to day because day to day activity anybody can do only few people can do the improvements only people like you can understand an opportunity and improve it so try to implement this this is the most sought after because your technical knowledge everybody has the technical knowledge what makes you different is such kind of skills and today means we are moving for the 5 trillion economy we need people like six sigma black belt people who can solve and you know improve their processes okay thank you very much all the best for your exams uh, excuse me sir yes uh, sir i am ov desh pande i had this doubt so we are doing this project uh, that's itself given by the institute so in that uh we do not have the entire uh, data for a process uh so uh, do we first uh, analyze and then assume the data for the measurement stage what do you suggest uh yes for a practice purpose you can assume some data and minitab helps you in that see if you want to create a data for example so that is purely for your study purpose okay that that project we take such project as study project not a real project okay so there is no problem because you don't get data always what do you do then okay so for practice uh, then uh, uh, take like that like in mini tab we have an option right just a minute. so if you want to generate a data 
just see what are the type of distribution which data you want if you want to want to generate a data of normal distribution and then uh, you can say that uh, let me mean that give me 100 data where mean i have a mean of 32.5 and a standard deviation of uh, 7 so if you ask me to have to give me such data for my practice and then tell them tell them what is which which uh, uh, table you want which row you want just click on c4 and then yes. see now many times give you a data of 100 data for, which is distributed as mean as 32.5 so now you can do it long if you if you want to do an ANOVA, uh, put a operator's name as a here uh, till uh, you know so this way you can practice it. no doubt in, no no problem in doing that but tell that mention that in your project that this is as, as a with a sample data hypothetical data okay that you have to mention in that project. and it should not be using you should not be telling that that's a real project okay now, if you want to do the basic statistics, then you can go to graphical summary and then uh, uh, you take this C4 and then put C, it gives all the graphical summary. Uh, what is a mean? See, you have asked to give a mean of around 32 point something. Okay, so many times I've given a mean of 32 points and with standard deviation 7.2. And uh, uh, you get this median, mean mode, everything. Okay, so you can generate data. No problem. Do it and then just uh, conduct your stream. Uh, so now if you want to do a, uh, do a control chart for you, just do it a control chart, take this data, go to uh, uh, X bar R chart, go to stat, control charts, four subgroups, make it an X bar chart. Now here you put as C4 and here you give it sample as we have taken 100 data. No? So let's take a sample of four. That means you get 25 data samples. See this. So two charts you get with the uh, X bar 25 sample and X bar So this way you can practice. Okay. Okay, sir. Right. Anything else?